Memory is something that we often take for granted. Google will give us what we need, and we have autocorrect for spelling errors, automatic locks on our car, and technology which literally can provide reminders for our phones. But with research, we have progressed to understand memory. Herman Ebbinghaus is well known for his initial work with memory and acted upon studying it. Ebbinghaus has shown us that there can be implications on memory. For example, time within different aspects of memorizing or being exposed to materi material and also mood or sensations and feelings. He also explained different types of memory, which are implicit, which is a, vol a voluntary recall, and explicit, voluntary recall. Hermann Ebbinghaus was a German philosopher and psychologist. In this capacity, he realized that there wasn't any regard to how to study memory. If other processes could be studied, why not this one? However, he realized the implications. It was difficult to measure. Memory can be constantly changing, especially according to certain moods and even time of day. Also, he found memory difficult to measure in numbers. Memory happens quickly, but he also saw that it could be measured between series and repetitions of material studied. He explains more of his methods and experience in his writing, Memory, a Contribution to Experimental Psychology. The nonsense syllable, or CVCs, is what Ebbinghaus used to study memory. Nonsense syllables are three, letter, three letters patterned with a consonant, then a vowel, and then a consonant. He created 2,300 of them. He chose to use nonsense syllables because they lacked meaning. And this was important to him for his experimental method because he wanted to eliminate any confounding factors. These syllables could also be created without replication um, in large numbers that could be created to a very large number that could have probably exceeded 2,300. He was the only subject in this study. With these syllables, he was able to measure the ability to retain and recall material over time. This led him to the famous forgetting curve, and I'll talk more about that in the next slide. But the picture at the bottom shows his result in the forgetting curve. This leads me to looking at the contributions Ebbinghaus left for future work to be completed. Research regarding memory since Ebbinghaus follows similar themes and findings from his work. In the forgetting and immediate serial recall, decay, temporal distinctiveness, or interference, decay is a prominent discussion. It is defined as the decline of memory of strength over time. The article also mentions that decay can be counteracted by rehearsal. In Ebbinghaus's work, he finds the forgetting curve. The forgetting curve shows how much memory was recalled over a certain amount of time after learning the material. He found that as time furthers from the point of memorization, that recollection, recollection decreases. In Ebbinghaus's article, he mentions his assumptions that the time taken to memorize and the number of repetitions occurring, um, he assumes that there is a relation between those two. And I think that this can relate to rehearsal as the forgetting and immediate serial recall mentions, as when it mentions countering decay. However, the forgetting and immediate serial recall article evaluates the role of time in forgetting from immediate memory rather than memory over time. Temporal distinctiveness is the association of material to a significant relation. Interference is something that may interrupt the process of memorizing or delay it. In the article, the progression is evident. In this method, 20 students were studied in conditions with the baseline condition, um, which is no delay at encoding or retrieving the material, then two other conditions with distractors. One of those ha it has one repetition of the distractor before retrieval of the material, and then the other has um, three repetitions of the distractor before retrieval of the material. And then two other conditions with one having one repetition of the distractor after encoding the material and the other with three repetitions of the distractor after encoding the material. It was shown that the four conditions with delay slash distractors had worse recall than the baseline condition. The delays damaged memory. In the in the four in the recall and retrieving condition uh, delays damaged um, how they recalled what was given to them. However, the delay conditions had no effect on encoding the material whatsoever. 
Longer delays had worse effects than short delays in retrieval. Evan Haas also mentioned factors that could relate to mood. In the article Mood and Memory, the effects of mood on recollection are studied. The memory and mood research was conducted by putting the subjects in a state of hypnotism. Prior to the hypnotism, they were asked to keep a recording of emotional incidents and rated them on a 10-point intensity scale. After hypnotism, half were in an unpleasant state while the other was in a pleasant state. It resulted that those in a pleasant mood recalled more pleasant experiences, and those unpleasant recalled more unpleasant experiences. After recalling, they rated the emotional intensity of the recalled incidents. It was found that participants shifted their rating scale towards their mood, their current mood. This pairs with Ebbinghaus's question of surprise, and if that would result in a change of attitude during the experiment. Although the mood memory experiment is dated back to 1981 and would probably now be likely seen as flawed due to the, re to the reliance on hypnotism, it can still be seen as stimming and stimming as a future part of Ebbinghaus's work. Evan Haas mentioned voluntary and involuntary recollection. In implicit memory, retention without remembering, implicit memory is defined closely to involuntary, involuntary recollection, which is defined as memory that requires conscious recollection, and explicit memory is defined closely to voluntary recollection, defining it as memory that reflects consciously on the past. The article discusses a study on amnesiacs measuring them with explicit tests, which is free recall from presented words, while another group was given a list of words and had to determine which ones were presented to them. Some were measured with implicit tests, which was to identify a word from fragments or to say what comes to mind. They were given a list of words previously also. It was found that in these implicit tests, amnesiacs and control subjects were similar in results. The same has happened with subjects considered normal or lacking um, any brain damage like amnesia. Subjects were given a series of tests, some with implicit and some explicit, um, like the test discussed before. In the end, it was found that generated words were recognized better than words that were read. This is a finding in many studies of explicit memory. The studies discussed in this article relate to Ebbinghaus's discussion of the different types of memory. Evan Haas has had a great impact of research over memory, and this is true whether researchers are aware of it or not. He may not have been, he may not have labeled certain concepts like implicit, explicit, or even really put a name to mood, but the effects are seen and they will continue to be utilized. Research will continue to stem from what Evan Haas has discussed in his writings and his legacy will live on.